Jack Shaheen considers the portrayal of Arabs in American movies and TV shows in his new book, Real Bad Arabs. This talk, hosted by American University's Intercultural Management Institute, is 50 minutes. Let me now formally introduce a good friend of mine, uh, who I've known for very many years, Jack Shaheen. Uh, and Jack, to give you the formal introduction, is a professor emeritus of mass communication at Southern Illinois University. He's a former CBS News consultant on Middle Eastern affairs. And he's one of the world's foremost authorities on media image of Arabs. He's the author of Arab and Muslim Stereotyping in American Popular Culture, Nuclear War Films, and the book that I particularly like, The TV Arab. And The TV Arab is the first book I had read by Jack. And we met quite accidentally um, during the Persian Gulf War in 1991, CNN uh, asked people to come in uh, who knew something about the image of Arabs. And I had done some work on this. And so I appeared on the C CNN program. And along with me was Jack Shaheen. Now, we weren't in the same studio. But I was amazed to find that we agreed on so many things. And uh, so I knew this was the guy I wanted to meet. And I, I read his book. And I was very impressed with his writings. And very few people had written about stereotyping of Arabs. I mean, we all know about stereotyping of African Americans and certainly Hispanics and, and, and Jews and other groups and how those stereotypes hurt. But nobody had written much about the stereotyping of Arabs and how that impacts public policy, how Americans think of Arabs and, and so forth. Well, in any case, I invited Jack to come up to the university, and he spoke, and we got acquainted. And we have kind of a standard uh, policy that whenever he comes through Washington, I buy him a cup of coffee. And then if I'm coming through somewhere, he, he buys me a cup of coffee. And this is just a ritual that we've had for many, many years. Well, this year, we actually conned him into coming to the conference and to be a keynote speaker at the conference. He also has written uh, a more recent book called Real Bad Arabs, how Hollywood vilifies a people. And it's a very nice reference book. It's a solid book. It is available over in the bookstore if you're interested in, in purchasing the book. As with Corey Flintock, Jack has one of the lead articles in the current issue of the uh, intercultural uh, I Am Quarterly. I think what you're going to discover with Jack is, first of all, his passion. He, he grew up in Pittsburgh. He's, of course, of, uh, of Arab ancestry. And I'm sure he'll share with you, and I don't want to preempt his talk, what it was like to grow up here in the United States and watch your own group, your own group portrayed in television and in movies. And what that did for your self-image. And then to read comic books and find out how comic books uh, portrayed your people. And as a young person, this is particularly impactful because this is where our attitudes are formed long before we become adults. And those attitudes, of course, are carried into uh, not only adulthood, but in our behavior with people who are racially or culturally or ethnically different. And uh, I find <clears throat> that the strongest part of Jack's presentation, I think, is his passion. And you'll, you'll hear it right away. He also very concretely gives you illustrations. I remember when Jack was taking on Walt Disney. And I thought, how can you survive taking on Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse and so forth? I mean, how, what kind of a mean son of a gun are you? And <laughs> he's, he's actually going to show you how Walt Disney or the Disney Studios have portrayed Arabs in a very negative way that is very hurtful because they particularly shape the way young people look at Arabs, but also the way young Arab Americans look at themselves. So this is the kind of talk I think you're going to hear from Jack, but I don't want to describe it any further, or he won't have a talk. So without any further introduction, <laughs> Dr. Jack Shaheen. <laughs> Gary describes my passion in a very cool, methodical manner. And he does that only because I'm drinking three or four cups of coffee while he's having just one. <laughs> and so <laughs> the caffeine element uh, impacts <laughs> the way the session goes. Thank you, Gary, for, for that fine introduction. And I'm, I'm pleased and honored 
to be among professionals who care about other people. When Gary mentioned coffee, he forgot to tell you the wonderful story about two professors here at American University, Wen Chang and Saul. They'd both gotten tenure and they went out to celebrate. And they'd been friends for decades. And Wen Chang and Saul, they were almost like brothers. And Saul looked over at Wen Chang after about three cups of super caffeine and said, I hate you. <laughs> and Wen Chang said, what are you talking about, Saul? You know, you're, you're my pal. He says, pal baloney. He says, you know what you guys did December 7th, 1941? What are you talking about? Pearl Harbor, that's what I'm talking about. You bombed Pearl Harbor, Saul, said Wen Chang. I am Chinese. <laughs> the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And Saul grimaced and said, yeah, Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, seen one, seen them all. <laughs> Ordered another cup of caffeine. Wen Chang looked at his good buddy Saul. He says, I've been keeping this inside, but I hate Jews. What are you talking about? Come on, Saul. April 14th. 1912, you Jews, what you did was awful. What are you talking about? The Titanic, you sank the Titanic. Wen Chang, an iceberg, sank the Titanic. Yeah, iceberg, Rosenberg, Bloomberg, <laughs> Goldberg. You seen one. <laughs> You've seen them all. <laughs> the nature of stereotypes. The origin from the old printing press, one plate, cast in metal. As a result, we have rigid, repetitive images of sameness over and over again. When we talk about perceptions of Arabs and Muslims in our culture, indeed the world, because America is the foremost leader of entertainment, our films, our television shows are sent abroad to more than 150 nations. And so when you see an Arab ugly here, you're seeing that same image around the world. We have to understand the impact that these visual images have on the hearts and minds of people. I mean, Plato recognized it in his Republic when he said, those who tell the stories also rule society. Lenin, at the end of World War I, was impressed with the cinema, and he said it was his nation's foremost cultural weapon. For us, the cinema is the most important of all the arts. Now, this was in the days when we had black and white silent film you know, there weren't many movie theaters, and yet he recognized the power of the cinema. At the same time Lenin spoke, here in the United States, the president of Paramount Pictures, Adolf Zucker, said the same thing, quote, as an avenue of propaganda, as a channel for conveying thought and opinion, the movies are unequaled by any form of communication, end quote. Ten years later, let's go to Rome. How about the Pope? Pope Pius XI, quote, there exists today no means of influencing the masses more potent than the cinema, end quote. Fast forward to Nazi Germany. About a year later, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, quote, the most brilliant propaganda technique confines itself to a few points and repeats them over and over, end quote. Stereotypes. Images of sameness repeated over and over. And finally, let's go here at home, 1998. Let's go to Hollywood. Jack Valente, you know, we all know Jack Valente, president of the Motion Picture Association of America, immaculately dressed, always well-behaved, well-mannered. He said, quote, Hollywood and Washington share the same DNA, end quote. Again, recognizing the power of cinema, the power of television to sway the hearts and minds of individuals. The New York Times came out with an editorial back in 1993 that I always keep at my side as a reminder. Professor Weaver mentioned how historically we've stereotyped almost every group, but it's unacceptable to focus on those groups today as it well should be. 
But when it comes to the Arab, wrote the New York Times editorial staff, only one form of bigotry remains an aura of respectability in the United States, prejudice against Arabs. Now that was 11 years ago, 11 years ago. The vast majority of Americans of Arab heritage are Christians. About 75% of us are Christians, like myself. Uh, we were born here. Uh, the vast majority of American Muslims are not Arabs. They're African and Asian Americans. The vast majority of Muslims, 1.2 billion throughout the world, uh, are really from Indonesia, India, Malaysia. Um, four or five are not Arabs, and yet, particularly since 9-11, the mythology that's embedded in most minds of most Americans is the following. Arab equal Muslim equal terrorist. The cultural other. Now, if we go back, flash back to April 19th, 1995, Oklahoma City, for 62 hours, network commentators throughout our country said, quote, the suspects looked Middle Eastern, end quote. Not one journalist, not one, ever asked this question. What does someone from the Middle East look like? Why not? Why was that question never asked? Seen one, seen them all. We flash forward to the tragedy of 9-11, where 19 Arab Muslim terrorists were responsible for the deaths of nearly 3,000 innocent people, 15 from Saudi Arabia, 19 of them. Do they all look alike? Are they all the same? Do they represent 1.2 billion people, one-sixth of the world's humanity? Or are they all like Star Trek's alien Borg, intent on assimilating us one way or another, forcing us to cow town to what they feel, how we should think and how we behave? Why is it that we take the acts of 19 terrorists and say to ourselves, that's what those people, quote, end quote, are like? those people. This stereotype of Arabs has been with us for more than a century. Every single living being has been exposed to it. We grew up with it. You and I, my grandparents, my parents grew up with it. Now my children are growing up with it. Your children, our grandchildren, each and every day on American television there are at least two dozen movies showing Arabs being trounced, ridiculed, bamboozled, true lies, executive decision, protocol, jewel of the Nile, boom, 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 boom. It's an unending barrage of hate the Arab images. And we sit by idly and no one reacts. It's as if, thank God they're doing it to the Arabs and not to us. Now, how did someone like myself get involved with this? I mean, I was born in Pittsburgh. I, Grew up in an Eastern Orthodox church, attended a Maronite Catholic church in St. Louis for 25 years. The priest's name was Shaheen. He wouldn't have anything to do with me, you know. He said, you're one Shaheen. And, no, I'm joking. We're very good friends. <laughs> and, you know, Shaheen's an interesting name. It's usually taken for Irish because it's close to Sheehan, Shanahan, Shane, all of those things. And, and I just read recently that the Shaheen 2 nuclear missile was launched in Pakistan. I have nothing to do with those Shaheens. Uh, there's Governor Gene Shaheen, the ex-governor of, uh, I'm regressing a little here, if you don't mind, the ex-governor of New Hampshire. We're not related. And of course, if you watch the movie Into the Night, uh, there are a group of terrorists uh, in the United States, Muslim terrorists, called Shaheen's Boys, who are out to seduce and do God knows what to Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I have nothing to do with those people. Uh, I, I just want to say, growing up in a, in a Maronite Catholic church or spending uh, 25 years there, you know, the, all of the information out on Catholic priests, 4% of Catholic priests have been allegedly accused of uh, abusing innocent boys and teens. And we should not even think that the vast majority of priests in this country fall into that category. They are a minority of a minority of a minority. And they do not represent the vast majority of priests who have do devoted their lives to the spiritual needs of those who come to their parishes. That stereotype we cannot, we should not allow ourselves to embrace. 
Growing up in Pittsburgh, I was unfazed by the stereotype. I had a nickname, they called me Shorty Shortcake because I was short and kind of chubby. I played good football, no one ever ran through me, they ran around me because I was, there was a lot of me there. <laughs> And I, you know, went off to college and, you know, I, I, I really didn't know much about the Arab world. I didn't know much about stereotypes, although I was always sensitive to stereotypes. I had a lot of black friends. This was in the 50s. And we bonded for many reasons. And there was always this feeling of mutual respect. And on, in our home, no word was ever spoken against someone because of their color their creed or their culture. Never, not once. And that sort of played a role, I think, helped me understand. When I worked the steel mills as a college student, mixing with everybody, whether they were from Poland, Romania, whether their ancestors came from Africa, you're down there in the mills working the 12 to 8 shift. No one cared. No one really cared where you were from. You know, what mattered is that you did your fair share of the work. Anyway, I got a job teaching at Southern Illinois, there in the Midwest, close to St. Louis, wonderful farmland, nice university, and life was great. I was doing research in children's television, public broadcasting, and then one day my children came up and said, Daddy, Daddy, they've got bad Arabs on. And they had been exposed to Popeye and Alibaba, Mad Dog of the Desert, and Porky Pig and Bugs Bunny, all of our cartoon heroes that we grew up, that we love. I mean, how can you not love Porky Pig and Bugs Bunny? I mean, you know, it's almost sacrilegious, you know, to go against Disney and, and, and Walter Lance and all of the great cartoonists. So that really sort of piqued my interest. And then uh, in 1974, I was fortunate to receive a Fulbright grant enabling me to teach at the American University of Beirut. And it was not until I was age 37 years of age, I, not until I reached age 37 that I met my first Muslim, that I went to my first mosque, that I began to see and understand that Muslims, like Jews and Christians, are children of Abraham. That I began to understand that when a Muslim prays, it's like when I pray, or like my son-in-law, who is Jewish, goes to the synagogue when he prays, that it's the same that the devotion, the love, the care. But Islam, historically, is almost always associated with violence. If you see a Muslim on television or in a film, he's always saying something or holding the Koran in one hand, a sword, or an AK-47 in another. So this stereotype is unique in that it links the faith with the actions of the terrorist or the or the oily shake. You know, it reminds me, when, when we were growing up, everything we came to learn about other people, particularly those of us with gray hair, like Professor Weaver and myself, uh, and, and those who don't have hair and, or who color their hair, but I, we better... <laughs> everything, everything we came to learn about other people came from our family, the kitchen table, uh, from the church, synagogue, or mosque, and of course from the school, right? Well, today it's the media curriculum. It's almost eradicating the three standard centers of learning. You know, there's a great song that sort of summarizes how we learn. It's from South Pacific. The heroine, Nellie, says that she cannot marry the protagonist, who's a Frenchman, who was once married to a Polynesian woman. And she says to her friend, I was born prejudiced. And the Navy lieutenant looks at Nellie, you know, who's a nurse, and he said, wait a minute. And he goes into song. I won't sing. It goes like this. You've got to be taught from year to year. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you're six or seven or eight, to hate all the people, your relatives. Today would be the media. To hate all the people your media hate You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. And that's what we've been. We've grown up with these images, images of Arabs as oily sheikhs, right? I mean, it's called, I call it the B factor. 
I like to play with, you know, words. It's the billionaire image. You know, it's Abdul Latif, I come to your country. You, you have blonde hair, blue eyes, come with me. I make you a rich woman. You be wife number 874, please, you know? <laughs> it's sort of like, uh, you know, I mean, he's financing nuclear terrorism, abducting our women, and he, he certainly has a thing for blondes with blue eyes. <laughs> then there's the bomber image. Now, all of these images are well embedded in our psyches. They are the images primarily in writing Real Bad Arabs, I document close to a thousand films. And these are recurring images over and over again. The bomber, we always see the Palestinian as a terrorist, never as a victim of oppression. We see Bedouin bandits, you know the Bedouin bandits, they pop up from behind the sand dunes and there's the legionnaire, Gary Cooper, you know, with, with a blonde, blue-eyed heroine, heroine and they're alone in the fort. You know, and she says, kill me if, you know, if we're going to lose. I don't want to let those people get me. And they come charging into the Legion fort, and Gary Cooper kills all of them, right? That image parallels the image of the American Indian in cowboy and western scenarios, where we had the American Indian coming over the, over the dunes and the open plains, right? And there was a member of the U.S. Cavalry, and he had the heroine at his side. And they, too, performed and acted like savages, didn't they? We never heard them speak, <clears throat> excuse me, they uttered a language that was inaudible. They were a, a mass of savages wearing funny clothes out to kill the civilized Western protagonist. Now, the only other two images are the, the buffoon uh, bodyguards and the bargainers in the, in the marketplace. You know, in the Arab world, those of you who have been to the Arab world, most merchants are extremely hospitable. They offer you tea, they offer you coffee, you know. But in Hollywood movies, they say, I give you good price. For you, you know, this normally $850. For you, $8,500, you know. I mean, they're always cheating you, you know, especially in the film Casablanca. If you look at Casablanca very carefully, you'll see the man trying to cheat Ingrid Bergman of all purposes. You know, I mean, Ingrid Bergman, he's trying to cheat. And then finally, when it comes to women, the image is, 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 is no better. Uh, Arab women are always submissive. Now, my wife has Arab roots. <laughs> I, I, I see these movies, you know, where the oily shake goes, and the woman comes over and says, yes, master. And I tried that with my wife once. I, and she comes over and she says, thank you, Jack. You know, it takes a <laughs> You know. And uh, that's as far as that went. <laughs> or, or, or they have no identity. They're bundles in black. You've seen that. That's usually a, an image attributed to the women of the Gulf. Uh, they're, they're bumbling subservience. And occasionally, in movies like Black Sunday, uh, they're bombers. They're terrorists. Now, several years ago, Janet Reno, at a conference here in Washington, said, quote, there is a direct link between false perceptions of the Arab American community and harassment. What she really did not say and should have said is that this Arab stereotype, these mythical images of the Arab as a subhuman being who hates everybody, everybody, particularly Christians and Jews, has been now been transmitted to Americans of Arab heritage and American Muslims. There has been, since 9-11, on commercial television, more than a dozen television shows that portray Americans of Arab heritage as terrorists and as a threat to their country. We've never had an identity on commercial TV. The only Arab American characters ever to appear, Danny Thomas back in the 50s and the old Danny Thomas show, and Jamie Farr running around in a dress as a lovable character in M.A.S.H. There has never been a woman, you know, that we could, uh, an Arab-American woman that we could relate to. In other words, we're not part of the cultural mainstream. So what? Well, what, what, do, what do Arab and Muslim Americans do? I mean, what do their children see? There are no self-images. You know, we're invisible. And so when they look at the TV screen, dad and mom come up and say, don't watch that. You know, they're stereotyping. They're vilifying your heritage. And there's nothing that they can look to. There's no doctor like Dr. Michael DeBakey or attorney like Ralph Nader 
There's no one like journalist uh, Helen Thomas. I mean, all of these shows that we see, Friends and Seinfeld and Frasier, not one character is a Haddad or a Shaheen or an Abdul Latif. And, what, and this exclusion, this invisibility, goes back to what Edward R. Murrow always said. What we do not see or read is as important, if not more important, than what we do see what we do read, this exclusion. In other words, the only thing that's left are the stereotypes of Arabs. Now, a few weeks ago, I picked up a copy of the New York Times, I mean, to show you, to show you how this myth is embedded in American culture. It was great, I couldn't believe it. It says, Arabs in the United States are among top donors to Bush's campaign. Wow! Arab Americans are mentioned 22 times. Wow! Guess how many Arab Americans the article talks about? One. The rest are Iranian and Pakistani Americans. The entire essay talks about one Arab American. So the question is, does this journalist not know the difference between an Arab American, an Iranian, a Pakistani? And if the New York Times doesn't know, who does? <laughs> briefly, briefly, because I want to focus on the impact that this has in possible solutions. Let me briefly say to you the television shows that have done more to injure and question the loyalty of Arab and Muslim Americans. Shows like Sue Thomas FBI, close to half a dozen episodes, and Threat Matrix, which is produced in cooperation with our Homeland Security Department, show us conspiring with Al Qaeda trying to blow up parts of our country. Shows like The Practice say that it's okay for an Arab American to be excluded from flying. The entire episode said that an airline could discriminate against someone because he was an Arab American. And if they didn't want to fly him, that was perfectly okay. Or another show like Family Law, which the thesis was that you should not trust an Arab American accused of terrorism because he, in fact, may be guilty. And finally, two of the most offensive shows. One is The District and the other is Navy NCIS. In the district, they focused on, on hate crimes against Jews, blacks, and Arabs. You empathize with the Jewish victim, with the African-American victim. The Muslim victim, we find out, burned down his own mosque, and they take him away to jail. This is the message of a show when in fact all the mosques that have been vandalized in our country and all the harassments taking place, they dare write a show saying that a Muslim burnt down his own mosque. So what, what feelings do we have about Muslims? We cannot empathize with them. They are not like us. They're different. Now why should we care? Why, why care? I mean, we're not, most of us here are not Americans of Arab heritage. We're not American Muslims. I mean, so what if you guys are being profiled? And so what if they're rounding up immigrants and detaining them without due process? And so what if somebody's kid is changing his name from Harry to Hussein and her name from Layla to Linda? And so what if kids don't want mommy and daddy speaking Arabic, just like many African-American children had no role models to look up to once upon a time in our country? So why should we give a hoot? Why care? Why care when a representative from New York City, Representative King, says that 80 to 85 percent of the major mosques in our country are controlled by Islamic fundamentalists, that American Muslim leaders are, quote, an enemy living throughout the United States, an enemy living throughout the United States, or an enemy among us. And then we have another fellow from North Carolina you know, who blames his divorce. He's married 50 years. His name is Republican Representative Cass Bassinger. 50 years. And he said because they live so close to the White House, there was this Muslim organization that made his wife nervous. So he had to divorce her. Because <laughs> he couldn't cope with her nervousness because she thought all those Muslims over there were part of a terror group. And then last week there were a group of brownies who happened to be Muslims in a mall in Herndon, Virginia, you know, and a guy comes up to them and accuses them of waging a holy war and starts accosting them, calling them names. I mean, they're dressed as brownies. They're selling cookies. They're, you know, I mean, so even they're not safe to some extent. Well, we care because what has history taught us? We were able, good white 
Christian boys in the South were able to lynch blacks, weren't they, while their wives and their children stood by and not feeling anything at all. It was an acceptable act. We could massacre American Indians, could we not, and displace them. Why? Because of the dime novels and the way they were vilified as being savages, not like us, worshiping a different god, not like us. We could incarcerate, incarcerate 120,000 Japanese Americans because they were always portrayed in the media not as Americans, but as Japs, due in part primarily to the newspapers of William Randolph Hearst and to Hollywood which never showed them like us. Because their color was different, we could put them in camps. We could have people like Walter Lippmann, one of our greatest journalists, as well as Edward R. Murrow, approve of the incarceration. They were Japs, not Americans. Just like today, for many Americans of Arab heritage, we are not Americans, we're Arabs or we're Muslims. It's the same connotation. What do you Arabs think? You know, sometimes I lecture, and the next day there'll be a headline, Arab professor. Oh. What happened to Pittsburgh, you know? <laughs> you know? And finally, the most horrific example of all, the Holocaust. Six million Jews perished. Why? What made it easy? The vilification of the Jew is the cultural other. Yesterday's Jew, today's Arab, the image is exactly the same. Yesterday's Jew, the black cloak, the black hat, always out to destroy the world with his banking money to seduce the young, blonde, Aryan woman. And of course, his God is different than the Christian God, according to the myth. Today, it's the Arab, oily money, out to destroy the world with his petrodollars, again to seduce the innocent woman. Again, the Muslim God, supposedly, is an alien God, a moon God, the myth. The image of that Jew of yesteryear and today's Arab is exactly the same. Just remove the armocha and the black cloak and give him a robe and headdress, and you'll see the same Semitic features, exactly the same. Images and words are weapons. They hurt. This image, regrettably, will persist until the day comes. Are you ready? We go to Chinatown when we travel. We go to Germantown, right? We even go to Greek town. Anybody want to go to Arab town? Hmm? Why is no restaurant in our country called Arab restaurant? It's Haji Baba. Alibaba, Jerusalem, Mediterranean Taverna, but not Arab. Why is the word, the word brings fear, the word Arab. It doesn't reflect 280 million peace-loving people in 22 different countries. It brings fear. It conjures up the image of all of those terrorists that we try to see. Now, what should we do about it? And why does it exist? It exists for many reasons. During the q and I'll elaborate. It exists because of indifference and ignorance, because of politics, greed, a lack of presence. Americans of Arab heritage are not a part of the image-making process. Apathy, religion. But I think the primary reason is silence. The movers and shakers, as Dr. King said, the people of goodwill have remained silent letting the people of ill will take over. Now, the future. The future, I'm optimistic. I think it's because I always felt that our country's pretty special because we're an open nation and because we've unlearned many, not all, of our prejudices from the past. Xenophobia and prejudice are the flip sides of harmony and tolerance. If we are to illuminate our common humanity, we will shatter these stereotypes. There needs to be an Arab-American summit, like we had a Russian-American summit at the height of the Cold War, where we had Arab and American, uh, this time Arab and American filmmakers and journalists sit down and speak to one another to unlearn prejudices. A proposal was sent to the Department of State and it was rejected to have this summit. I think that's a tragedy particularly in, the, in, in light of all the money that we're spending trying to bring people together. Do our troops in Iraq and around the world believe that Arabs and Muslims are like everybody else, that we're more alike and different? Or do they think Arabs and Muslims are all terrorists? What's the answer to that question? Have we ever asked them? You know, Corey made an interesting point yesterday 
but breaking down doors and try to understand. Now, can you imagine all of our troops, or most of them, have seen a vast majority of these movies, haven't they? And what have these movies taught them about Arabs and about Muslims? And what should the solution be? I was reading yesterday about Colin Powell and President and Mrs. Bush. They saw a movie about an Afghan child called Usama, a 12-year-old girl who poses as a boy. And they're sending it on video to all the troops overseas. And I thought to myself, are they going to take these 950 Arab bashing films and show them to all the troops overseas? Or have all our troops overseas seen these movies and have already made up their minds what to think about those people? The history of our planet has been and continues to be the mixing of peoples. The majority of us have a mixed racial ancestry. So the, our goal, the goal of fellow professionals like yourselves, should be to help strengthen the bonds between peoples here and abroad, be they yellow, black, purple, red, orange, regardless of the color. We are more alike than we are different. We all basically want the same things from life. Never doubt, said Margaret Mead, that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, that's the only way it ever happened. Again, I want to thank Professor Weaver and each and every one of you for having me here. I want to conclude by sharing a poem and a couple of prayers. The poem was written by Anwar Sadat's daughter, Camelia, and it goes like this. May God grant you light, light in your eyes, light on your right, light on your left, light from above, light from below. May God's light grant you light in your soul, and may his everlasting spirit guide and remain with you and your loved ones now and forevermore. And this Cherokee blessing, may the warm winds of heaven blow softly on your house, and may the great spirit bless all who enter here. And finally, this Irish prayer, because Shaheen is so close to Sheehan. <laughs> may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, until we meet again, may God continue to hold you in the hollow of his hand. Thank you for having me. Okay, I told you he'd be passionate. Uh, <laughs> what we'd like to do now is open this up to any questions from any of you, and if you just stand up so I can recognize you and the fellow with the large boom mic can find you um, and talk as loudly as you can. Any questions or comments about anything that Jack has said or not said? Well, okay, over here. Okay, the boom mic is coming. First of all, I'm a Pittsburgh native also, so hello. hello. <laughs> Go Steelers, huh? <laughs> um, I guess all of us here uh, as diversity practitioners or people interested in the concept of diversity sort of um, have to deal with the dichotomy between focusing on similarities and focusing on differences. And it's something you always have to deal with, um, especially in a work environment. And I guess one sort of question or issue that comes up that I was thinking of is the problem with saying we're all similar, you know, Arab Americans are similar, one sort of you know, the same things that everyone else does, is that maybe uh, someone in the majority would say, well, if we're all the same, then they're all like us, which is something that, you know, you don't want to be saying. So I guess the question is, in a work environment or for diversity practitioners, 
how would you sort of make the distinction between focusing on the similarities but also saying we're all not the same because of these differences? That's an excellent question. And the reason we never are not aware of the commonalities is we never see them. <laughs> uh, you've never seen a movie. I, I just did a chapter for a book. Uh, Hollywood has only produced 20 movies featuring Arab American characters. 14 of those films were clones of Usama, Muammar, and Saddam. And the other six, we make fleeting appearances. So you have no idea of the commonalities. Maya Angelou said it beautifully in one of her books. I, I don't have the quote handy, but basically most people want the same things out of life. Good health care, good education, a safe home, a decent spouse, someone to love, a place to worship, freedom, all of these attributes. The differences come in the heritage. Thank God for that. I mean, we all have our different foods, and, 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 and they come in where we worship. But, but there are also many, many striking similarities. We have a tendency to dislike what we do not know. And it's like with Japanese Americans. We didn't know how American they were until after they were released from camps. And so the danger that exists now, particularly with the inability of this administration, and I say this, I've always been critical of administrations. I'm not singling out Bush, our president. But this administration, if it is indeed serious about bringing peoples together and bringing peace to the region, if it's serious, it had better start looking at Hollywood's images. Not that it should influence Hollywood's images, but they need to speak out and condemn these horrific stereotypes. Otherwise, these images are going to continue to separate us. Can you imagine the impact of these films on young Arabs in the Middle East and young Muslims? I mean, American films are very, very popular, and they see these images. What do they think we think of them? And so the commonalities that you talk about, that you, that you express so beautifully, if we don't see Americans of Arab heritage acting like they do on Friends and on Frasier and on any other TV show, how can we hope to understand what they're like unless we live next door to them? It's very, very difficult. Um, Dr. Weaver talked about your um, case with Disney. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, Disney. I have to be very calm. <laughs> Disney has done perhaps more damage to Americans of Arab heritage and Arabs worldwide than any studio in the past decade. Their insensitivity, their arrogance, particularly under the leadership of Michael Eisner, whom, by the way, I would like to meet sometime and have coffee with, <laughs> if he would ever step down from his pedestal and recognize that I have concerns just like he does, <laughs> that Arabs and Jews are both Semites, and that the standards that his studio uses to demean Arabs and to vilify Arabs, he does not use to vilify Jews. He needs to understand that. Now, there's a new movie that Disney came out with called Hidalgo. It's a $100 million epic that incorporates every stereotype that's ever existed. It's a cowboy Indian movie. The, the protagonist is half cowboy and half Indian. And he goes over to the Middle East, and I stopped counting after he killed 30 Arabs. You know, and he wins the horse race. It is the most blatant piece of racism I've ever seen since Rules of Engagement, which came out in 2000. They've done, Disney's done at least one film a year. Be calm, Jack. One film a year. <laughs> Since 1992, that in one way or another has focused on Arabs as, as, as the cultural other. Kazam, a family film with Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Father of the Bride, part two, where they introduce an Arab-American couple. You know, you've got to wipe your hands after seeing the movie. They are the sleaziest of the sleaze in a very, very fine family film that has nothing to do with Arabs. Aladdin, oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place where the camel caravans roam. If they don't like your face, they, if they don't, I don't know, they cut off your ear or something. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. I've forgotten the tune, I'm sorry. 
And I, I mean, they're, they're just totally insensitive to this. And this is a studio that could make a big difference. I loved Disney growing up, you know, and I wish that Michael Eisner, bless his heart, would, would look at these stereotypes and think twice. You know, I, I really do. And the producers and the directors that, 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 that put out these images, there's no sensitivity at all. I highly, all, I highly recommend Hidalgo. It is a film guaranteed to make your hair stand on end because it is so obnoxious and so rude and does more to separate people than any film in the last four years. It's an embarrassment. I'm embarrassed. First of all, I totally agree that um, motion picture has a po political power to uh, perpetuate stereotypes and to enact symbolic violence. But I also think the film industry is a business, so it's meant to make money. It's meant to, um, to win the market, to uh, attract the customers, the, the viewers. So uh, do you think there are so many stereotypes in the movie, also partly because that's what the f viewers want to see. That's what ma uh, will make the uh, movie popular and successful in an economic sense. Well, one of the reasons this stereotype endures is because these movies make money. <laughs> I mean, remember what I said earlier. These images have been with us for how long? More than a century. So we've grown accustomed to its face. <laughs> And it's going to take a courageous young filmmaker to step forward and shatter this stereotype, to debunk all of these myths. I mean, you don't need to vilify a people to make a dollar, do you? Of course not. There is such a word as balance, isn't there? I mean, we did it for Af to African Americans for decades, didn't we? Sambos and Mammies and with Asians and Fu Manchu. We don't need to do that now. We don't need to continue to repeat all images over and over again of a people that, says, that say basically they are subhuman beings that do not value life as much as we do. And that's what the industry is doing. They have a responsibility. There is no film that is morally, ethically neutral. They all have a message. They have a political content. They teach us really whom we should love and whom we should hate. Oh, someone with white hair. Good. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. I, I found they were extremely helpful. Um, I just wanted to make uh, two, uh, point out two things um, uh, based on my experience. Um, first of all, um, in the long history uh, in the United States of groups trying to make it, um, there are, I think, two factors that have generally led to eventual success. One of them has been the assiduous work, sometimes uh, for decades, uh, by organized groups. I think in particular the NAACP on behalf of African Americans, B'nai B'rith on behalf of the Jews, uh, where those organizations continue to um, uh, essentially argue with the media outlets and make the point that even-handedness is, is needed. Um, and uh, the other factor is uh, uh, when uh, people in such groups uh, achieve a significant number, whatever that would be, of their members that end up in the highest levels of society so that they have uh, financial, academic, uh, perhaps government experience credentials or corporate credentials so that they also are seen as leaders not only of their groups within society but so social leaders for the for the common good. Um, I think those two uh, angles have tended to uh, to break through this barrier of discrimination that you described. Um, I, I wanted to uh, point out something. I, I think probably you were aware of it. Um, about a decade ago, uh, the State Department made a video uh, and had it distributed to a number of uh, posts overseas. And I can't remember the exact name, but it was something like 
um, Arab Americans, the the invisible minority or whatever. Yes. And I must say, I remember being overseas when that came out, and and I was not aware uh, of the uh, uh, existence of such a large Arab American community, uh, and and yet that was in fairly recent years. And I, I'm just thinking that indeed, in many ways, this is a community that is invisible in some of the ways that I described. Uh, I know there are various groups. There's a Mr. Zogby, uh, who heads one of those groups. But um, obviously, more work needs to be done. Well, those are excellent comments. There, there are organizations engaged, doing their very best. But I must be honest with you, every attempt is usually met by Hollywood with, with yawns of indifference, you know. Uh, and, and Americans of Arab heritage, uh, for most of us, we don't boast about our heritage. It's, it's not that we aren't proud of it. We are, but, but we don't. And, and we're everywhere except in the entertainment industry. We simply, uh, there, for some reason, there, we have a tendency to practice law and become doctors and computer specialists and teachers and everything but make movies. But that's beginning to change. And I think if there's any lesson to be learned about shattering stereotypes from this conference and cultural diversity, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, is that whether you're, an Ara whether you're a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, if you see someone's faith being targeted unfairly, speak out. And, you know, it's the same with color. Don't just defend those of your own group. You know, don't. Don't do that. Don't become a Johnny One Note. You know, sort of become like Professor Weaver. You know, Java Gary, you know. <laughs> Here's a cup of caffeine, one for all and all for one. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Very, very good. Jack Shaheen is author of Arab and Muslim Stereotyping in American Popular Culture and the TV Arab. His latest, Real Bad Arabs, is published by Olive Branch Press, an imprint of the Interlink Publishing Group. Visit interlinkbooks.com for more information. You're watching Book TV.